Hello, and welcome to the Curatorial Series, presented by me, Malcolm Trail, on behalf of the Museum of the Great Southern, part of the West Australian Museum. We're based in Albany, in Western Australia. And I'm a historian who specialises in Albany stories and Albany tales. If you've seen any of this series so far, I hope you've liked them. If this is the first time, then welcome. It's nice to have you here. Today I'm going to talk about the Chinese, who were very much a part of Albany society for many years, over the late 19th, early 20th century, but not so much now. Why has this happened? What was their influence? And why did they disappear from our lives? Well, let's hope all will be revealed in the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. So, where do we start? Well, probably with the arrival of Chinese people in Australia. Now, a theory came out quite a few years ago now, 2002 I think it was, of an arrival by a Chinese fleet into Australia back in the 15th century. And the story, story was published in the Age newspaper as a book review. And you can see from that headline here, it's official, Admiral Zeng beat Cook to Australia. And this was quite a sensational story at the time. The book was called 1421, which is when the author, the historian Gavin Menzies, had fixed as the year China discovered the world. So how did he fix on this and what was his, his thesis? Well, his thesis revolved around a famous Chinese admiral, Zheng He, who had an amazing ability, navigational and as a leader, to travel the world from China in the early 15th century. He had a fleet of massive ships, the Chinese treasure ships they were called, and they had amazingly large crews. So he could stay at sea for months and months at a time without finding land. These ships were so large that they were like floating cities, the cruise ships of today. This picture shows one of those treasure ships in comparison to one of Columbus's ships that sailed to America just a little bit after this period of Zheng He. So the theory was that the Chinese had come to Australia in 1421-1422. The ships were massive, 122 metres long by 27 metres wide. And Menzies claimed that Zheng's vice admirals, Hong Bao and Zhu Man, beat Cook by about 350 years. The two men apparently arrived in Australia in 1422, Hong Bao on the west coast, Zhu Man on the east coast, and spent several months exploring landing in several places. Now this book and this thesis raised a lot of interest at the time and it created an awful lot of academic debate and dissent. Because as historians we need evidence and there was no physical evidence to prove this. Certainly Zheng He, the Admiral, had the ability to sail right throughout the Indian Ocean to the coast of Africa and around the Pacific but there was no evidence that he actually reached Australia. So the book by Menzies was somewhat debunked, I suppose, at the time. But it certainly showed that the Chinese had the ability to come to Australia. The first Chinese to be recorded as a migrant was actually in 1818, just over 200 years ago today. And the name of the, uh, the settler who arrived in Sydney in 1818 was Mak Sai Ying. We don't have any, any images of Mak Sai Ying, but his family continue to live in New South Wales today. Here's the first photo of one of his family, John Shai Ying, who was the grandson of the first Chinese settler in Australia. He was actually in the army, in the military. But then Mak Sai Ying's family actually set up as in Parramatta, the village outside Sydney, and John Shaying was an undertaker in Parramatta. Here's a picture of his undertaker's shop in Parramatta. 
So we know that the Chinese arrived in Australia more than 200 years ago, and that was earlier than the first Euro European settlement in our part of the world in Albany. So what about Albany? And what do we know about that? So before I get on to Albany in particular, let me say there were two waves of Chinese migration to Western Australia. The first was quite early. In the 1830s and 1840s, there was a great labour shortage in the colony. So early settlers were looking to import labour from wherever. Quite a few Indians came to Western Australia and also a few Chinese. So the early Chinese wave of migration came in the 1840s, mainly as indentured servants, as farm workers, because they had skills in that area. But really it was to add to the workforce of, uh, of the colony which was struggling to sustain itself at that time. The second wave of Chinese migration, which we'll come to in a little while, was around the 1880s. And that was around the time of the early gold rushes in West Australia. We'll come to that in a minute. For now then, let's look at this man here, John Wollaston, because he records one of the earliest Chinese settlers in Albany. Who was John Wollaston? Well, he was the first minister at the Anglican Church of England Church in Albany. He arrived here in 1848 from the west coast, from near Bunbury, and his mission was to complete the church known as St John's, which had been being built for about eight years and had struggled to be finished. There was just not the labour or the skills around. Wollaston settled here and his first place of residence was this little cottage in York Street, which he rented to start with in his first period in Albany before the rectory, which is part of St John's Church, was completed. So what's the connection with Chinese folk from Wollaston's point of view? Well, he actually had a Chinese servant. Let me read a little bit from his diary because he talks about his Chinese servant, Archium. He says, in October 1848, Our Chinaman, Ah Chium, proves an excellent servant, and we have never before experienced such help as we now enjoy. He has picked up a few English words, such as bread, water, lamp, etc., and which he repeats over to himself, and when he has learnt them, never blunders afterwards. He can dig in the garden, is a capital barber, and he does all our downstairs work. He has learnt to set out the table and keeps everything very clean. His figure is exactly like that seen on a china cup or fire screen. Has a long tail, that's a pigtail, generally twisted around his shaved head. And on the next day, in Wollaston's diary, he writes again. We have much to be thankful for. Our Chinese servant is a great help and does all we want. John is trying to teach him his alphabet and the names of things in daily use and is himself learning the Chinese terms for them. So here we have evidence of bilingualism in Albany in those early days and certainly how useful the Chinese servants were. Not a large number, only probably less than, less than 10 in Albany at that point, but Wollaston had written about Archeum in glowing terms. Now things were about to change in Australia in terms of, of Chinese migration, because in the gold rushes of the eastern colonies in the 1850s, around Bathurst, and Bendigo and Ballarat, the Chinese proved so industrious and so tenacious that the Australian gold diggers certainly did not appreciate their, their persistence and their ability to find gold. And this led to a lot of quite vicious riots against the Chinese and a lot of early racism uh, against their ability and against their presence. 
It was not a pretty time. And moves were made within the colonies, because this was, was of course before Australia became a nation. Moves were made to restrict Chinese migration. So the New South Wales government and the Victorian government made laws to restrict Chinese migration to make sure that they were kept out of the country and those who were here were put under much stricter conditions. Now the Chinese migrated mostly not as families, mostly it was single men or married men who came on their own. So a lot of the wealth that they made was actually sent back to China, another thing that got up the noses of the authorities. And we also find that it is a Chinese custom to die in your homeland. So many older Chinese left Australia to go back to China to die. So there's very little evidence of Chinese settlement left in Australia. If you go to a place like Bendigo though, you'll find amazing Chinese temples. But nothing much like that in Albany or in Western Australia. Let's move forward a little bit, little bit and come into the 1880s and 1890s in WA because that's the second wave of Chinese migration taking place. These Chinese were again attracted by gold. Early gold finds in the Kimberley, in the northern gold fields, and then in Coolgardie and Kalgoorlie did attract some Chinese, but because of the restrictions on migration, there were limited numbers. Those who did come in often started laundries, shops and made furniture. They were further restricted when Australia became a country, a federation, in 1901 by the Immigration Act of 1901. Now the Immigration Act of 1901, just got a fairly bland title, it's actually the 17th Act passed in the Federal Parliament. You can see a copy of it here. It was the forerunner of the White Australia policy a notorious policy which was designed to keep out Asians. Now, this of course affected Chinese people markedly. Those who were here were probably okay, they'd assimilated, but they certainly weren't going to be joined by a rush of Chinese from China. Many of them I mentioned got into furniture making, and this was another source of discrimination. Have a look at this newspaper advertisement from that old and well-known shop, Foy and Gibson, forerunner of David Jones, who are advertising furniture, bargains and special lines in all departments. And it says European labour only is employed. And further down in the middle, it says all the above furniture made by European labour. This was a mark of distinction to actually buy furniture which wasn't made by Chinese. So you can see the the invading racism that was happening right throughout society. Now in Albany at the Museum of the Great Southern, we have a small display about the Chinese. And this is one of the interpretation captions that we use about settlers from China. Some were recruited from Singapore, but in about 1890, Miller Brothers, the timber millers, recruited about 20 Chinese labourers to work on their timber mills in Torbay. They were labourers, they were cooks, they ran laundries, but uh, the total population of Chinese in Albany was never much more than about 40 or 50. Much of the evidence of Chinese in Albany sadly comes from the court reports because it seems that the police used every opportunity to arrest Chinese people. But fair, Fairly minor misdemeanours, I would say. In 1900, you can see a report called a Chinese rumpus. There seemed to be a bit of a fight, a bit of a domestic fight going on between two Chinese. And they were fined for that rumpus. But also, and I'm not sure if you can see this in the article, there was evidence that the Chinese were smoking opium which was their recreation, but it was also, of course, against the law. And the same thing happened in 1907. 
a raid on Chinese gamblers. Not only were they gambling, but they were smoking opium as well. Two things that were illegal at that time. Now, let's think about it. With single men, that was their only recreation, was gambling, not for high stakes at all, and smoking a bit of opium, which they grew for themselves. They were hardly terrible lawbreakers, but they certainly were, were targeted quite strongly. And in 1911, this was the high point, I guess, of the, of the discrimination against Chinese in Albany. There were 32 arrests, as you can see, from this article from the Albany Advertiser. So 32 arrests, and I'll read a little bit of the report here. Because there was suspicion that the local popu Chinese population were gathering in a building named the Old Brewery in Cuthbert Street for gambling purposes. The venture, the police raid, was well-timed and effectively carried out for no fewer than 32 celestials, and that was what we called the Chinese, were caught red-handed. 32 were arrested. It goes on to say that the number of handcuffs at the disposal of the local force is, however, limited, and the celestials had to be taken to the station in three batches, a process extending well into the night. Very little money was found on the tables. The china counters, black and white, were apparently largely in use. An extensive gambling outfit was seized, but no opium could be discovered. They found quite a lot of money, and they appeared in court on the Monday morning before Mr. Burt, the magistrate. One was charged with keeping a common gaming house, and the remainder of the party, the other 31, with being found on the premises. It turned to farce because the interpreter was not able to be understood by the Chinese people. And uh, it actually degenerated, I suppose, and an adjournment until the following morning was granted. The following morning, the accused R. Gum admitted his offence was fined £25, a substantial amount, with costs, and the remainder of the party were each fined £3. All fines were paid, it reads, and the revenue thus benefited to the tune of something like £120. Now, those 32 arrests of the Chinese in Albany, that amounted to some 80% of the Chinese population. 80% of the population were in jail over that weekend. What a farce. In the museum of the Great Southern, we've got these, this evidence of the opium pipe and sieve, the scales to weigh out the opium, and the box. These are some of the very few relics that remain from the Chinese in Albany at that time. Perth was slightly a different story. There was a Chinese association called the Changhua Association. It still exists today and goes strongly in Perth. It's quite influential. And many of the Perth Chinese residents <coughs> became market gardeners, as they did in Albany. Now, we don't have any photos of the Chinese market gardeners in Albany, sadly. It was obviously not something that wasn't photographed. But we do have photographs of Chinese market gardeners in other parts of Western Australia. Here's one of Chang Ah Su in his market garden in York, east of Perth. And several of Chinese market gardens in South Perth. Those of you familiar with Perth will probably know that the area around the foreshore of South Perth, stretching towards the causeway, were full of Chinese market gardens, well watered areas, with little shacks and rows and rows of beds growing veggies. So several of these photos refer to those Chinese market gardens. We do have evidence in Albany of some of these market gardeners because they were very much part of the community. And have a look at this article from 1920 in the Albany Advertiser. It looks like a list of names. It's actually the re the prize winners and the results of the annual agricultural show in Albany. And this is the vegetable section. So I can see that in the cauliflower section it was won by R. Sim, 
The carrots, the long carrots, were won by Ah Wa. Second was Ah Sim. Further down in the French beans, there's a Japanese, S Yokochi. But further on, Ah Sim came second in the beetroot section. And down in the globe onions at the bottom, Ah Wa won that section too. So they were great gardeners. They had their own methods. They watered by hand. They had huge yokes that they would carry filled with water and carry these yokes over their shoulders. It was always a, a point of fascination for young men and young boys around Albany to watch these Chinese gardeners in action. Where were those gardens? Well, several in the flat areas around North Road. If you know the playing fields in Albany, <clears throat> those areas are quite damp. So they were suitable for market gardens. And the area below what is now Albany High School, down Campbell Road, there were market gardens there too. So anywhere where there was a good supply of water, good drainage, Chinese could cultivate and turn their hands to that. And several, I believe, actually were further out from Albany. They would bring their produce in by horse and cart to be sold, often door to door. So here's a picture of a Chinese vegetable cart in South Perth. And this would have been a similar story in Albany. There's oral recollections of Chinese gardeners loading up their carts with their old horse and selling door to door to householders. One of the recollections of Chinese gardeners comes from this lady here. Ethel Hassel, as she was before she married, came from an old family, a patrician Albany family. The Hassel family had been here since the 19th century. They were farmers, but they had a townhouse as well. And Ethel remembers living in this townhouse here. It's named Hillside, a grand mansion on the side of Mount Melville with sweeping views over the harbour. It was a lovely house, still is. They had a Chinese gardener at Hillside as well. And Ethel remembers in her oral history interview, she remembers the staff at Hillside. The question was, who were some of the people who worked at Hillside, Grandmother Hassel's home? Ethel said, the maid was Eliza Finlay, the chauffeur was Wheeler, and there was the old Chinaman gardener, Ah Kit. The Hassels indented Chinese labour down here for two years, but of course a lot of them never ever went back. Old Ah Kit became the gardener at Hillside, and he had the most beautiful ve veggie garden. Originally they carted a lot of manure and stuff in from the outer properties, and he grew the vegetables and always looked after the chooks. He was a tiny little short Chinaman, and he had a huge big stock whip. When he fed the fowls, they were in three separate groups. He would throw the wheat down, and he knew which chook belonged where, and if one of the chooks happened to move over to another group, he would crack that stock whip and you would see it fly back. They used to fascinate us children. I always remember when we were very young, he often used to look after us while mother went down to do the shopping. He was really a very fine old fellow who eventually died here. He had one son by an Aboriginal woman who was a very good footballer down here. Old Jack Kitt is well remembered in Albany as a footballer, but our Kitt, his father, was a typical Chinese gardener who was always very polite, very fastidious, and a very clean little fellow. He had his own little two-room house, as Hillside was quite a big area, and it went down from what is now Cross Street, as far as Parade Street, down to what is View Street now. In the early days, when they built all the houses here, each one had to have so much land around it because they didn't own their own cows, their own horses, their own fowls and grow their vegetables. They had nothing to eat. So each place was like a small farm, what we now call a hobby farm. So that's the story of our kit, the Chinese gardener, remembered by Ethel Hassel, and this drawing of the separation of the chooks was actually in her book that was published with her oral histories. The Chinese market gardeners died out in Albany as horticultural practices became bigger and more broad acre. 
and they never brought their families here very much. They would go home to die. There's a few, a very few Chinese graves in the Albany Memorial Cemetery. So there's not much of a memory of those Chinese from the pre-war days of the 1920s, 30s and 40s. But there is a modern link to a Chinese family in Albany, and it revolves around this man here, Morris Fong. Morris still lives in Albany. He's retired now, but he came here as a young man who'd left Hong Kong, traveled around and ended up in Albany and thought that it was a nice place and he would stay here. He opened Albany's first Chinese restaurant and the wave of Chinese restaurants in Australia in the 60s and 70s, well, Morris's restaurant called The Double Happy was one of those. It was the first Chinese restaurant in Albany and Albany people flocked to it. They loved his cooking, he was a great cook. He had traditional Chinese ways and he ran a, a wonderful establishment. Morris sold the Double Happy restaurant and went into semi-retirement, but he also taught cooking in Albany at TAFE. So his cooking tradition continued. He, in his retirement, he also took up art. And to overcome his fear of water, he actually bought a boat. So he became a member of the Albany Sea Rescue Group. His integration was complete and amazing. For so many years, the only identifiable China, Chinese person in the community, yet he was very much, is very much part of the community with his wife, Helena. So the Chinese tale has gone full circle. From those early days in Parramatta in New South Wales, through to the 1840s, the Chinese servants, who then became the Chinese gardeners, the market gardeners who supplied Albany households with fresh vegetables, right through to the present day of Morris Fong. I hope you've enjoyed that tale of the Chinese in Albany. It's a fascinating one, and one that's long forgotten. I hope you'll look out for our next curatorial series on this site. Thank you.